Hi everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Beverly Quintana and I work in the Communications Department here at the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, or APSHO for short. On behalf of APSHO, I wanted to thank you for joining us for today's webinar entitled Steps to I Write Start, or STARS, Developing a Family Resource Center to Promote Healthy Child Development and School Readiness. As a collaborative effort with Charles B. Wan Community Health Center in New York, we're excited to present you with today's webinar on the importance of early childhood development and education services for Asian American parents and caregivers. Joining us as your presenters today is Charles B. Wang's Chief Strategy Officer, Xiao Ji Sim, and SARS Program Manager, Daisy Chow. Before we get started, I wanted to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's webinar. Here we are looking at an example of the GoToWebinar attendee interface, which is made up of two parts. The viewer window, shown here on the right, but maybe on the left of your screen, depending on your browser or computer, allows you to see everything the presenter will share on their screen. The control panel, shown here on the left, maybe on the right of your screen, allows you to participate in the webinar. By clicking the orange arrow button, you can hide or show your control panel. You can also set the control panel to auto-hide or not to auto-hide by going to the view menu up top. You may submit questions in writing during the presentation by typing them in the questions field. We will be reviewing them as they come in and we'll have a Q&A period after the presentation. If you'd rather ask your question verbally, please indicate this by clicking the blue raise your hand button. We will be keeping track of those individuals and we'll hope to have time to have each of you speak during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please mute your phone and your computer so that background noises are not transmitted. Lastly, before I pass the meeting over to our presenters, I also wanted to quickly tell you a little bit about APSHO, who we are and what we do. APSHO is a not-for-profit national association of community health organizations. We currently represent 29 community health organizations 21 of which are federally qualified community health centers. APSHA's mission is to improve the health status and access of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and other Pacific Islanders. And with that, I'll pass the meeting to Xiao Xi Sim, Charles B. Wang's Community Health Center's Chief Strategy Officer. Yeah, uh, thank you, Beverly, again. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to uh, welcome everyone uh, again, you know, for joining us uh, 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 in this same uh, uh, webinar. Um, uh, 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 and uh, first, you know, I uh, wanted to acknowledge uh, uh, APCHO, the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, uh, for helping us to organize this webinar uh, because we recognize it's so important, uh, uh, you know, uh, to 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 get the lessons learned out there uh, from this uh, very interesting, very exciting initiative. Um, uh, uh, so that other community health centers, as well as you know, uh, uh, other organizations, can learn about um, our initiative. Um, it was about three years ago uh, that uh, Charles Wiwen Community Health Centers. Uh, uh, we were very fortunate to receive a three-year grant from the WK Kellogg Foundations uh, as part of their uh, early learning initiative. Uh, they want to see more uh, connection and linkages uh, between healthy child development. Uh, and school readiness. Uh, so we were approached by the foundations, and uh, and we developed an initiative, uh, 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 really looking at you know how we could uh, help improve um, uh, uh, our pediatric patients and their caregivers and and parents' uh, uh, capacity and readiness uh, as 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 we look into our school readiness readiness issue. Um, uh, and as you can tell from the first uh, from from the acknowledgement slide, um, this is not an initiative that you know uh, was. Uh, are uh, only uh, in, uh, developed by the Child's Women Health Centers. Uh, we work with uh, uh, partners and organizations across uh, different uh, spectrum in the community. Um, uh, you know, and, and we're very proud and you know, and also very thankful you know of their contribution. Uh, I'll, I'll go over very quickly in terms of the overview of the presentations. Uh, my co my colleague here, um, Daisy Chow, uh, the program manager, uh, will share you know uh, a lot more detail with you about. How we implemented the project, uh, you know what, 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 you know, you know, and what were some of the lessons learned. Uh, but I will go very quickly about, you know, the overview of this uh, webinar. Um, uh, I'll first give you a very brief introduction about the Charles B. Wang Community Health Centers, um, uh, 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 and then we'll talk about the project background, uh, some resources that we've developed, we developed from the from this initiative. What were some of the major findings and some uh, future plans? Um, 
in terms of uh, the background for the Child Spirit and Community Health Centers, um, uh, we've been around uh, since 1971. Uh, we are a nonprofit, federally qualified health centers uh, that's based in New York City, um, uh, and we serve primarily low-income Asian American populations. Uh, we uh, uh, we are based in uh, uh, two geographic locations in Manhattan Chinatown and Flushing Queens. Uh, based on our last uh, 2011, uh, uh, we we uh, we we saw over 42,000 patients uh, and uh, a combined you know, visit number of over 250,000. Uh, and uh, uh, we offer a range of uh, primary care services from internal medicine to women's health, pediatric, dental, mental health, social work, health education. Uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, frontline uh, health career training as well as community-based participatory research. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the characteristics of our patients, uh, again, as I said before, this is uh, primarily a low-income, med medically underserved uh, Asian Asian American popula patient populations, uh, and we have uh, close to or a little bit over uh, 500 full and part-time bilingual and, and bicultural staff. Um, uh, now I'm going to pass the mic over to uh, to Daisy, uh, who will. Uh, uh, share with you uh, uh, some highlights uh, from the SARS initiative. Thank you, Shaoqi. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Daisy, and thank you again for attending this webinar and for your interest in our project. Uh, so today, I will in introduce you to um, the rationale and the components of the project. And then by the end of the webinar, we hope that you will have the tools necessary to replicate and or adapt uh, this program for your community health center. And then finally, we also want to briefly mention some of the challenges that remain at the end of our project um, and some of the findings based on our unique population because we'd love to hear more about your thoughts and um, specifically about strategies for improving this project. Um, so as Xiaoqi had mentioned, uh, we received the health center received a three-year grant to promote healthy child development and school readiness. In other words, um, we define that as ensuring that children are maturing properly and ready for the often stressful transition into kindergarten. And as we've heard, uh, many of the parents and caregivers that we see in our community are low-income, foreign-born, and have low English proficiency. And, of course, we all know that access to affordable, linguistically appropriate services for this population to support child, children's development is often quite limited. So we wanted to better understand the needs of our population so that we could more efficiently improve access and utilization of services. And also, um, we wanted to understand the culturally unique factors that affect Asian American families' ability to prepare their children for school here in the U.S. So how do we address these challenges? Well, firstly, we wanted to conduct a, a multi-level community needs assessment which, uh, we in which we targeted parents and caregivers of pediatric patients ages 0 to 5 um, because of the emphasis on early childhood development as well as staff in the local community agencies that work directly with this population, such as the staff from early intervention programs, daycares, schools, and of course the staff, um, the clinical staff at our health center. And um, I just wanted to um, highlight some of the quotes that we found the most compelling from, these need, uh, from the needs assessment. Um, uh, these quotes are regarding the parents' and families' needs. So I'll just read through them and then highlight a few themes. Um, one parent said, developmental delay is a personality trait. It depends on how the, ch the mother teaches them. Um, another community stakeholder staff uh, member said, I don't think the parents understand the implication, the future implications, if you don't correct certain things. Uh, another staff member said, a lot of the expectations from the families are about straight academics and nothing about social emotional well-being. They hesitate to, uh, the parents hesitate to access services because they think it'll affect the children when they go to high school or college. And finally, it's confusing. There's so much out there. So um, a few themes really stand out here for us. Firstly, um, there is a need for education. There seems to be a knowledge gap. Specifically, more education about the nature and implications of developmental delays. The science, um, the the recent science behind developmental delays and um, and parent-child interactions in early childhood. 
Um, many parents in our population tend to focus on the fact that most developmental issues uh, will resolve over time. However, um, uh, research has evidenced tremendous benefits of early intervention for delays and um, improving school readiness. And as, as many of us may know, school readiness at uh, kindergarten is predictive of a myriad of achievement outcomes, including high school test scores, college GPA, income, and even retirement savings. Um, another thing that we also noticed for our population is that there seems to be a lack of understanding about the different domains of school readiness. That's not simply about academic skills, uh, like reading and math, but also the ability to understand and control emotions, play with others, um, and interact in a productive manner with adults in, in a classroom-like setting. However, um, it's important to keep in mind that many families in our community are unable to afford uh, formal child care services, and therefore um, the, we've spoken to many parents who stay at home with their children and are unable um, unable to, and the children are unable to practice interacting with peers in a classroom-like setting. So of course the transition um, into a kindergarten, a very um, new experience for the children can be very stressful. Um, okay, and so uh, these are the some of the parents' needs that we um, thought were interesting um, to share, but we also wanted to know more about the staff level needs. And so, um, and not surprisingly, uh, there seems to be a similar knowledge gap um, and a desire for more education, more education on child development and school readiness on the staff level. Um, one of the questions that we asked in our surveys um, to uh, community stakeholders was, what information or training would you like to receive to improve uh, your ability to provide feedback to parents regarding developmental delay and uh, early childhood development. Oh, excuse me, this is actually for our clinical staff. So, um, and as you can see by, um, um, through the table, that many of the participants stated that they would like more training on developmental issues in young children and behavioral issues, um, as well as uh, more understanding about the common myths and misunderstandings of early childhood development and school readiness. Um, many of the staff also said they wanted more um, information and resources on early intervention services in the area and ways to improve uh, early literacy uh, and um, also more knowledge about major uh, childhood milestones, developmental milestones. So um, in summary, I, I think the needs assessment really uh, underscores a lot of the the things that we already know um, about this about early early childhood, mainly that families families need more assistance accessing appropriate services and navigating a fragmented early childhood system. Um, and then we also know that community members and families both need more culturally appropriate educational resources about the importance of early intervention for developmental delays. So. Um, given all this information, how how does one um, how does the staff in a community health center uh, how, uh, able to tackle this challenge? Um, well, our initiative uh, Steps to the Right Star or Stars for short um, developed a logic model, um, and we use the logic model to define our different resources, uh, objectives, short-term and long-term outcomes, and intended impact. Um, I've included this logic model for for our reference just to give you a sense of the overall scope of the project, but for the sake of time I'll just focus on the strategies. Uh, so as you can see under the objective strategies section, um, our first goal was to identify children um, that were at need. So um, we defined these, these children as um, zero to five years old um, and then um, that and the risk is that they would develop poor school outcomes. Um, the second strategy was to provide these identified families with um, improved access to education and support services that promote school readiness. And then finally, to promote the public's awareness about um, child development services and resources in the community. 
Um, so with regards to the first um, strategy, namely um, accurately and officially identifying the vulnerable children, our staff implemented a standardized and validated developmental screening tool called uh, PEDS, Parents Evaluation of Developmental Status. Um, I'll go into more detail about uh, the PEDS screen later and what we found um, near the end of the project, but just to give you a sense, the PEDS um, PEDS screen is a 10-item questionnaire, and we chose it because um, it takes only five minutes to complete. It requires minimal training to uh, to implement, and it was available in multiple languages. So um, that was very convenient for us because our population is primarily Chinese-speaking. So when the caregiver and pediatric patient um, between the ages of zero and five come to the health center for a wild child care visit, the medical assistant or nurse um, provides a copy of the screen in their preferred language and then the and then documents the results in our database. So um, this is a screenshot of our nursing note. Um, this is the electro this is our electronic medical records database. And the PEDS has been um, has so has been programmed into the database under the screening and assessment, uh, screening a risk assessment uh, component. And then so when the nurse or the assistant clicks the button, it takes them to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, takes them to the PEED screen in the, um, uh, where the nurse and medical assistant will document and score the responses uh, on the bottom right hand corner. And so as you can see, um, there's the, the 10 items, um, and <coughs> based on the, based on the uh, re replies of the parent, then the parent will, uh, the, the medical assistant will receive a notice at the bottom of the screen if there are a certain number of predictive delays, uh, predictive risk factors for delay. In this screenshot, it says, screen positive for developmental delay, consider EI or CPSC um, which, which stands for Early Intervention and, and uh, Community for um, Pre... Uh, there's, there's a typo, actually. It should say CPSC. So Community for Preschool Special Education Services. And then possibly, uh, possibly audio, audiolog <laughs> uh, audiology and mental health services as appropriate. So... Um, uh, I also wanted to mention a few other things regarding the planning and implementation of the screen. Firstly, uh, the pediatricians initially were pretty concerned that the screen would not pick up concerns because of um, the high stigma for developmental delay in, in our population, but this wasn't the case. They found that actually many parents were very um, open and eager to share their concerns. Um, and also, uh, uh, the pediatricians were concerned that if they detected a screen that they would not have any resources available for them to refer the parent um, directly or that it would take a long time for the parents to receive the, the, receive the services and therefore it didn't seem um, like it would be uh, an effective tool but actually we found that um, because of this project we were able to more efficiently provide them with services. So um, that's what I'll talk about next. Um, so this, after the screen is implemented, um, based on what the parents have uh, noted as some concerns, they receive educational materials um, that are based on, that were developed by, oh, <coughs> sorry, uh, Beverly, can I go to the next slide? Okay, great, thanks. Um, so these educational materials were um, developed based on the most commonly reported developmental concerns and uh, literature reviews, and, the, and they support the one-on-one -on -one educational sessions that the um, medical assistant or the nurse has with the patient. During these sessions, um, basic education about child development um, is, is addressed, and, um, and the nurses also try to answer any additional questions that they have about child development. Uh, these brochures and pamphlets have been reviewed by pediatricians and mental health specialists at the health center. 
um, as well as health educators to ensure that they're accurate and accessible to um, our population. So they're written at um, are written at no higher than a sixth grade reading level. So uh, this is the oh sorry, let me try to change the slide. Beverly, do you know if I could if we can change the slide? Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so um, these are some additional pamphlets. The left one is um, the, the development, developmental milestone pamphlet, and we have them for different age groups of, uh, of our uh, population, pediatric population. And on the right, you have um, a sample brochure of um, how to how to promote social emotional skills. Now that um, now, after the uh, pediatric patient and the caregiver receive the one-on-one -on -one educational session, uh, the caregiver and parent then uh, the caregiver and parent or um, and the child meet with the pediatrician to discuss any remaining concerns. And then, if the pediatrician believes that the family would benefit from from more monitoring or um, support, then he or she contacts the care manager. And then the care manager um, reaches out to the family after the visit to share ed additional educational resources and also to um, see if they're interested in enrolling in our newly developed workshops and support groups, um, which are part of our uh, family resource center. So this family, um, so I just want to be clear that this family resource center is more of a, a virtual hub and um, a virtual hub that addresses early childhood um, concerns, and uh, it's it's a reference it's a reference point for our staff. Um, so the workshops and support groups that are under this umbrella term, Family Resource Center, um, are are uh, there are a few interesting differences to note. Um, first of all, the workshop topics are. Uh, as, as listed, you can see they're um, they're quite uh, uh, diverse. Uh, early literacy and play and child development um, strategies to manage your child's difficult behavior, promoting daily routine and self care, and uh, nutrition and health uh, healthy habits. And the workshop format is uh, more like a lecture format in which uh, the facilitator, e either a physician, social worker, or mental health specialist, um, presents educational um, material on these topics, but the support group uh, is is a little less structured, and it targets the most vulnerable families, usually um, the parents of children who already who already have a formal diagnosis. Um, the facilitators are social workers, um, and the group is much smaller. It's about um, at the most uh, 10 to 11 parents, to so that uh, the the therapeutic relationship of the the participants and the social worker are preserved. So during these um, events, we believe that it's it, it it gives the caregivers a chance to learn valuable parenting strategies to support their child's health and learning. Um, we've also developed partnerships with local community-based organizations such as the YMCA, uh, Chung Park, which is a daycare center. And uh, Movement Matters, which is a clinic, a therapy clinic that offers occupational speech and physical therapy. Um, and these partnerships have allowed us to broaden and enrich the types of activities that we are able to provide. For example, um, our our partnership with um, Movement Matters has allowed us to utilize their um, their therapy clinic, which has a, a child-friendly, safe a school-like environment. They have toys there and and um, the pads, uh, so that the the children can engage in activities like play activities, literacy activities, while the parent is in a support group. Um, and we believe that this is really valuable because this again gives the children themselves an opportunity to interact in a school-like setting. Um, also, the presence of the children allows the specialist uh, that it's working with the with the, um, uh, the parents in the support group or workshop an opportunity to demonstrate concrete strategies for parent-child dyads. So, um, 
This has been really helpful because child activities typically require much more staff and specialized space. So uh, that's, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, furthermore, to reach um, parents and caregivers in the broader community, we submitted educational articles on uh, common parenting concerns to local newspapers. Uh, this one is about discipline and um, it's to promote an upcoming workshop on, on discipline. And um, we've also hosted, hosted two radio programs um, on uh, common early child development issues to increase the import, uh, to increase the awareness of the importance of um, not only physical but socio-emotional development. And I've heard from multiple parents that um, these resources in the newspaper on the radio um, are a really good way of engaging um, caregivers like fathers and grandparents because sometimes it's been uh, uh, some of the parents have reported to me that it's really difficult to engage them, especially when they're talking about a topic like social emotional development. But you know, um, when parents said that you know if it's in the newspaper, then the fathers will really pay more attention to it. <clears throat> so um, it's really important to think about uh, multiple uh, different ways to engage uh, other caregivers, other um, uh, caregivers that the child has. So uh, one additional resource that we've developed is the Steps to Right Start video, which is a 28-minute video. Um, and it, it's available in English and Chinese, and um, it's about f the, it's it's a narrative of four Asian American families who ha um, express some common child developmental concerns, and um, a child specialist, the child developmental specialist, shares some tips on on um, ways to address some of the concerns. So it's available on our website, but um, right now we just wanted to show you. A short clip from the video, which fe which features one immigrant um, parent's concerns about parenting their child in the U.S., and also uh, a developmental a discipline strategy that the the child developmental specialist shares with with the parent. Ponekamalle 這個問題就會影響到他們在學校的人際關係和學業的成績只是好像找其他東西去混淆了這個注意 that was a short clip from a video and um, about um, you know one discipline strategy that was employed. But if you um, have time, feel free to look at the rest of the video. There are um, it it's really the the heart um, of our initiative, and we created basically to share the core message of of this project. So um, just want to. Um, Okay, so um, now um, I want to share some more information about um, our specific population and some of the cultural implications 
of implementing a project like this for our family, um, you know, primarily low-income, um, uh, low-income Asian immigrants uh, with low English proficiency. So, um, in year two, when we we, uh, we screened more than 2,000 patients using a standardized and validated screen, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the PEAT screen. And approximately 17% of patients screened were formally diagnosed, which is consistent with the national average. However, um, more importantly, we identified that nearly half of the parents um, that were screened reported a developmental concern and therefore had children who were um, defined as at risk for delay according to this uh, developmental screen. Then um, about 25% of them, 13% of families overall, um, attended a workshop or support group, but we believe that the demand was actually higher because many parents who expressed an interest in attending were unable to because of logistic reasons, um, or and we often had to put a cap on registration for several of the workshops and support groups to preserve the uh, intimate um, interactive quality of the activities. So we believe that there is definitely um, a need for these services. <clears throat> also, we found that um, per the percentages of high and medium risk patients were higher in our um, sorry. Okay. Um, the percentage of high and medium risk patients were higher for our population than um, was noted in previous studies um, indicating the U.S. norms. So um, this suggests to us that our population really is, um, may have a higher need for these types of services. Uh, we also noticed, uh, we, we thought it was important to note that the most frequently reported concerns were related to speech and behavior and that um, some of the differences could were um, um, significantly, there were significant differences between gender. So in um, looking at these findings, we really don't have um, ways to address them at the moment yet, but I, I think that um, in uh, developing future services for this population, this would be maybe important way to, uh, important thing to look at and um, a strategy for um, uh, improving the efficiency of our services. <clears throat> um, um, one of the other findings that we thought were would be relevant um, to note is that uh, parent-child separation was a risk uh, was was associated with higher risk for developmental delay in this population. Um, uh, reverse um, reverse migration basically is, is something that we ha um, the pa pediatricians at our health center have noted um, uh, as a uniquely uh, uniquely a culturally unique uh, phenomenon in which the parent um, gives birth to the child in the United States. However, because of limited resources, um, they are unable to uh, take care of them. Uh, so they send either the children to live with relatives, um, to, to live with relatives in the country of origin. And um, this is something that we um, think that is important to, for other um, uh, clinical staff and other community health centers to notice because um, it is uh, we found that it is associated with higher risk for um, developmental delay according to the PEAT screen. Um, and as you can tell, parental stress and parental support, as, pre as one might predict, is, is also associated with higher risk for developmental delay. However, in our population, we um, did not find that par parental depression was associated. So, um, um, yeah, we thought that was, um, that was some, an interesting finding. <clears throat> um, and we also uh, wanted to share some of some of our unanticipated benefits of the project. 
firstly, um, the, we found that many community agencies were very receptive to um, the project and to donating their time and uh, staff, uh, time and time and space to help with um, help, help with many of our activities. Um, and so uh, we we were very we were very fortunate to be able to work with them, and to which enhanced our um, activities greatly. Uh, we also found that um, one of the most positive feedbacks and consistent uh, feedbacks that we've gotten from the parents in workshops and support groups is that they really relish the opportunity to learn from other parents. Many of the parents have reported being, you know, um, spending. Uh, many of many of our participants of the workshops and support groups are single mothers, and so um, they uh, often spend a lot of time with their child, and they have limited support networks in the in the U.S. So they really um, value the opportunity to meet other parents and um, and learn about the di diverse ways that parents uh, approach child child development and parenting. Um, finally, uh, we also wanted to note that there was a growing rate of parental engagement. Um, in the first year of the project, it was actually quite a struggle to um, to recruit participants for activities uh, because it was unfamiliar and we were just starting out. But um, the care managers have noted that over the years, as we've developed relationships and built trust with the patients, that um, and and um, improve the quality of our workshops and support groups that they've been eager to come back and also they've um, they've been able to benefit from word of mouth um, as, a, as a method of um, learning about these opportunities. Um, and then f finally just wanted to I mentioned briefly some of the challenges and barriers that we experienced in implementing this project. Um, some of the things that uh, we've already talked about, um, basically uh, gaps in co coverage and service options. Um, we, we know that um, there have been major funding cuts in the early education services that have decreased the number of services available, um, including uh, even for um, even for um, patients that used to be able to uh, have services but because of funding cuts now are ineligible. Um, so there's still the risk there and, and a gap in coverage. Um, we also, um, one of the, the things we've noticed in our population is that there really is a need for uh, child care. Um, basically when we implement the workshops and support groups the parents are much more likely likely to attend if there are child care services available um, because they have limited options in terms of um, um, you know leaving their their child to be cared for elsewhere uh, so we believe that affordable child care services is um, a, there's a critical need for that and it also helps us um, improve the <clears throat> Um, improve the participation rate um, in in our services. Um, low SES. I think uh, this is something that we've mentioned already. This is um, more related to just there's competing financial priorities for the parents, and there's low social support as immigrants, um, and there seems to be a lack of understanding or um, education about developmental delay and school readiness that really affects this population, and it is related to the phenomenon that we're seeing, um, you know, the, the parent-child separation and, and reverse migration. So I think um, it is worth it's worth noting as a um, not just a a cultural a, a, a factor that affects our our population, but um, for uh, you know many many parents who struggle with limited uh, financial resources. And then um, we all we've also noted the high stigma of um, being labeled as delayed. That remains a concern. Um, stigma, I, uh, we believe, is related to mistrust or fear of the long-term consequences of being labeled. So one possible solution is just more education about the 
the benefits of early intervention and for the parents who seek services more affordable and culturally appropriate interventions. For the staff, some of the barriers that we've noticed is engaging other caregivers. As I mentioned before, the fathers um, and the grandparents have been um, very difficult to engage. Most of the participants of our workshops and support groups have been single mothers, um, stay-at-home mothers, sorry, stay-at-home mothers. So um, it's uh, um, so we really want to explore additional ways of engaging the other um, other other adults that are involved in the child's upbringing, and then finally limited space. Um, as we noticed, as I noted before, um, we've we've had to cap the registration for some of our events because of space. <clears throat> so, um, and then for the sake of time, I just want to move forward and um, just provide a brief summary and show you where you can access some of these resources online. Uh, basically, the community health centers serve as an important access point for vulnerable, underserved communities. Um, but we believe that an on-site family resource center in a primary care setting can help staff and caregivers address early child developmental concerns and improve school readiness. And then finally, of course, there's um, more culturally and linguistically appropriate educational resources and care coordination are needed. So um, many of the resources that you, you saw in this um, presentation are available in our Family Resource Center Toolkit, and um, which provides health centers with promising practices and resources. Um, we provide general guidelines as well as um, a, and sections about our specific experience implementing um, each of this uh, uh, components. Uh, this is just a brief overview of the of the table of contents. This is the type of information that you will you will um, see in our toolkit. Um, and then finally, this is our website. So um, as you can see, uh, if you go to our homepage, you'll see the Family Resource Center toolkit at the upper right hand corner. Uh, so if you click that, it'll take you to um, a brief form, and once you complete the form, you can download the toolkit. Uh, for for the rest of the video, for the rest of the video, you can also go to our um, website, um, and I will provide um, uh, I'll provide this information also in the post survey that will be sent out after the webinar. So, without further ado, I just want to um, thank everybody for attending and um, open the floor up for any questions and comments. Thank you, Daisy. After all of that great information, we're eager to hear from you on the phone. As mentioned at the beginning of the call, you can submit questions via your questions or chat um, field on your control panel. Or you can also raise your hand by pressing the blue hand button. And we'll go ahead and unmute you so you can ask your questions directly for Daisy. Authorin, go ahead. Authorin Blackmore, are you there? You, you're unmuted, or but your phone might be muted. Hi, Authorin. Okay, we can't hear Authorin right now. I do have one question um, for you, Daisy, from sure. May Fuenabiki. Mm -hmm. Were the workshops offered to all ch children versus all who were screened as high risk? Uh, yes, the workshop was um, offered to anybody who was interested in attending, which is why we posted it in the a newspaper. It was more a way of education, uh, educating the broader community. But the support groups were for our high risk population. Um, identified through uh, in our pediatric population. 
Thank you for, the, for that question. Um, I just also wanted to make a note about um, the comment that I made regarding uh, parental depression not being associated with increased risk for developmental delay in our population. Um, um, it, it's also possible that the the tool that we use, which is the um, PHQ2, was not sensitive enough for our population to identify really the, the depressive symptoms. So it's not necessarily that uh, depression is not associated with risk, it's just we were not able to detect it um, with the tool that we had. Um, yeah. Thanks, Daisy. Um, I know you touched a little bit about this on your presentation, but if there were community health centers or other organizations who wanted to get a similar program started, what would you recommend as, as sort of the first step to getting things rolling? Um, I'll let, I'll let Shalchi answer that question. Sure. Okay. Um, um, I, I think as we as we mentioned it on the on the presentations, uh, you know, definitely, um, uh, uh, you know. Uh, one, you know, the community health centers, you know, or any other organizations who are interested in this initiative, they should really find out, you know, um, what their community needs are, you know, you know, what types of parents and kids they are serving, uh, and what are some of the challenges and barriers for them to access the services. I think, you know, you know, the ability to be able to, uh, you know, you know, conduct a very timely, comprehensive needs assessment uh, would be would be very, very important. Um, I will also add to, you know, you know, uh, uh, that, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, the mission of our health centers, you know, it's really to address the uh, med medically underserved populations. Uh, 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 but I think, you know, having critical leadership support and buy-in is also very important. Uh, the fact that, you know, we have our board, we have our senior leadership, you know, who are fully behind us on this initiative. I think, I think, I think, you know, that also, you know, you know, uh, speaks, you know, uh, that, that also uh, could provide, you know, a lot of, you know, the resources, you know, uh, 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 support, you know, uh, uh, for us to uh, get the initiative off the ground running. Yeah, and I think that with um, through conducting a thorough needs assessment, one can really make a strong case for why there should be more support for these types of programs. Of course, the very first step may be to um, look at our toolkit and see if that helps with any of, um, of uh, that addresses any of your concerns. And I did hear back from author and, and you're asking you mentioned a screening tool, PED. Uh, is there a way to access this tool? Yes, it's the um, uh, PEDS tool, the Parents Evaluation and Developmental Status. Yes. Um, uh, if you actually just, uh, if you look at our toolkit, um, you'll see a template of the screening tool. Um, another way that you could access it is actually also to uh, just Google it. Um, you'll find um, um, that it's it's linked to its developer, uh, Glass, um, Professor Dr. Glasgow, and so um, she's been very helpful in helping us implement the screens. So I'm sure she'd be open to discussing um, uh, discussing the implementation process with any of the other um, staff at the community community health centers. Okay, uh, just as a reminder, you can ask questions using your questions or chat window on your control panel, or you can also press the raise your hand blue button there, and we'll go ahead and unmute you. Um, Beverly, I would yes. just like to um, make a note to the audience that um, this is really a pilot program. Um, this is um, our first attempt at really engaging parents in our community to support school readiness or um, through like a community health center setting. So um, we know that there are you know many challenges to implementing a program like this and we just wanted to hear the thoughts, um, any additional, any 
any thoughts that the, the audience members have about implementing Daisy, you cut off there. Uh, can you repeat okay. the last part? Uh, yeah, so we'd just like to hear some thoughts um, from the audience about, and any thoughts that they have about our project or um, any barriers that they've encountered in working with their families. Um, doesn't have to be Asian Am American, um, but it would just be helpful for us to kind of have a sounding board and, and see what people are thinking about this project. Doesn't have to be a question, just say. <laughs> Daisy, before um, we jump into that, I do have another question okay, from great. Kitty Lou. Um, she says that she enjoyed and learned a lot. How do you go about training the community? Um, well, through our initiative, we were able to build partnerships with other um, community-based organizations. As I mentioned before, um, um, Oh, well, actually, I, actually, I didn't mention this. Um, so one of the partnerships that we ha we built is with uh, the a butterf butterflies program um, that's part of University Settlement, and basically they have early childhood cl clinicians that work with children with developmental concerns, and they were able to give us um, give the st staff at our health center a um, a uh, a training session on. Um, early childhood development concerns, how to talk to parents of this population about uh, developmental delays. Um, they also provided many resources on how we could um, access, uh, how, how we could help our, our families access early intervention services. So one of the ways that we found to be the most effective is to build those partnerships and find experts in the community that are willing to speak to our staff. Um, and that question was from John, Asian Services in Action. John, did you want to add anything else? Okay. We had another question from May. Um, she's wondering why a member would choose your FRC over Early Head Start, for example. What, yeah, what makes I, this program unique? Yeah, I, I think the unique aspect of, of why, you know, what, what will make us so unique from, you know, other types of, you know, early childhood interventions or programs is that, um, you know, we are using a pediatric clinic as the entry point, you know, in the community. You know, I mean, basically, you know, we are very busy clinic, you know, where um, uh, on, the, on a yearly basis, uh, you know, we see uh, over 12,000 pediatric clinics. Uh, patients, um, uh, 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 and, and I think the advantage of that is that you know uh, 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 it's it's for us you know it's it's easier to facilitate um, uh, 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 access you know, for, for our patients to be able to access uh, information, resources. I, I think the other underlying the other the other underlying factor uh, why community health centers you know uh, could be su successful in this venue is that. Um, a lot of our patients, especially the immigrant parents, you know, uh, they trust our pediatricians. You know, they, they trust the doctors. I think, I think, you know, the advantage of you know using our own pediatricians, the MDs, you know, to talk about the issue of school readiness and 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 healthy child development, you know, is important. You know, it's also uh, you know carry a little bit more weight and credibility. Um, I think you know uh, 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 this is really in a way it's a kind of an outside the the box uh, approach. Uh, you know, to looking at issues of uh, school readiness, uh, and 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 we'll continue to learn from our experience. Yeah, and I, as I mentioned before, um, you know, due to funding cuts, it's been more and more difficult for parents to access uh, or even qualify for a Head Start programs. So this is really um, a, a way to provide services for parents that you know leads. Uh, um, that, that helps parents not feel overwhelmed or um, intimidated by, um, you know, the enrollment process, evaluation, etc. Um, also, uh, 
for our population, as I sh as Shao Chi sort of alluded to before, um, it's easier. It seems easier to engage these parents um, to pay attention to school readiness from a health perspective. If you make it more of a medical issue, um, <clears throat> they uh, these parents seem to be more receptive to learning more about um, you know the the different domains of school readiness, for example. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you, Xiaoji. I think we have time for one more question. Again, you can submit your questions using your questions or chat on your control panel, or go ahead and press the blue raise your hand button, and I'll unmute your phone so you can ask Daisy and Xiaoji directly. I have um, one from Melissa, and she says, in response to Daisy's question and Xiaoxi's response, we have been partnering with a local EHS program. They actually are working with our pediatric providers to provide development screenings. We also have partnered with a local YMCA who recently launched a parent caregiver participation program with preschool and children to promote school readiness. We hope to soon launch on-site program at neighborhood housing projects. And Melissa, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to unmute you right now. Just um, if you could. Hello. Hi, Melissa. Thanks Hi. for for that summary. Did you want to add anything else? No, I think this is a great resource and a great program model. So um, we're looking forward to looking into the toolkit and seeing if this can assist us in exploring kind of how to how to proceed. Thanks. And Melissa, yes. can you tell us what organization you're from, just so um, we have it to refer to? Sure. Kaligi Palama Health Center. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Could you say that again? Kaligi Palama Health Center. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your comment, Melissa. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Um, and we're, we're here to... Um, we're eager to hear your feedback um, as you review the toolkit. So Great. good luck with your program. Sure, thank you. Okay, and I think um, we're almost at our end time. If there are, are no more questions, um, Daisy, did you want to, or Shaoxi, did you want to um, add anything else before we wrap up? Um, no, just thank you for uh, facilitating this um, this webinar. Um, I think that um, we're kind of, I'm sure we're preaching to the choir here uh, that it's really important to address uh, school readiness, and we hope to hear from um, the audience members about any of the things that we've talked about today or if any if they have any thoughts or suggestions for how we can improve these strategies please please contact us um, and uh, we'll also be sharing the toolkit oh yeah and um, they should feel free to share the toolkit as well so um, yeah so thank you Thank you, Daisy, and thank you, Xiaoxi. Um, if we were unable to answer your questions today, this slide includes ways you can follow up with Daisy and Xiaoxi directly. And you can also let me, feel free to contact me at my email or follow APSHA at, um, by visiting our website or our Facebook channel or Twitter or YouTube. Uh, I'll be emailing this presentation so you will have this contact information. Um, and as Daisy mentioned, we're, we're also going to be sending you a very short survey um, just so we can improve on our technical assistance efforts here. Um, lastly, I would like to thank Xi and Daisy and Charles Lee Wang Community Health Center who put this presentation together. Please keep a lookout for an email from me which will include the materials from today's webinar and the link to the survey. Thank you all again. Have a great day and it was great. Uh, having this discussion with you. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you, Xiaoxi. Thanks, Beverly. It's our pleasure.